Great, thank you, Effie. Um, so, uh, good morning, everyone, uh, or afternoon or evening, uh, depending on where you're joining from, and uh, welcome to our panel. Um, hope that everyone has been enjoying the Smithsonian Digital or Digitization Conference so far. Uh, during an in-person conference, I would normally ask everyone to give our organizers a, a round of applause, but that doesn't really work so well in this uh, interface. So um, maybe add an emoji to the chat uh, window to the side there. Um, uh, and uh, I just wanted to say that this conference began back in uh, 2006, um, and people who have attended since then have heard the same lists of advantages of digitizing collections. But I don't think anyone uh, prior to 2020 included preparation for a global pandemic in those lists. Um, so this panel uh, this morning uh, is titled Pandemic Pivoting, what we do when we can't digitize objects. Um, we'll be hearing uh, three presentations from experts in the museum and library fields, and then having a discussion afterwards. So uh, please submit your questions below. Um, and we'll do our best to get those answered in the discussion session um, afterwards. Okay, so um, introductions. Um, uh, I'll start with myself. Uh, my name is Mike Trisna. I'm a data scientist with the Smithsonian Data Science Lab. Uh, as part of the Data Science Lab, uh, I work with really smart people uh, in the, the various museums, research centers, archives, libraries, and a zoo um, around the Smithsonian on uh, machine learning and uh, data science projects. I also lead the uh, Smithsonian uh, Carpentries program, uh, which provides peer-led training on uh, data science skills to Smithsonian staff, fellows, and interns. Um, and our, our first presenter will be John Stack. John is, a, is the digital director of the Science Museum Group. Uh, the Science Museum Group encompasses five museums, the Science Museum of London, uh, National Science and, and Media Museum in Bradford, National Railway Museum in York, Science and Industry Museum in Manchester, and Locomotion in Shildon. Uh, he joined in 2015 and is responsible for setting and delivering the group's digital strategy. Uh, he manages the digital department, which encompasses the museum's websites, digitized collections, apps, games, and on-gallery digital media. Uh, Prior to joining the Science Museum Group, he was head of digital at Tate for 10 years. Um, then our second presenter will be uh, Megan Farader. Uh, Megan is a senior innovation specialist in the Library of Congress Digital Innovation Labs, LC Labs. Um, she has worked closely with libraries, museums, archives, volunteers, and partners to design and implement transformational and user-centered programs. Uh, with the LC Labs team, Megan engages diverse audiences with digital collections and fosters an innovation culture in the pursuit of the library's digital strategy. She has led the creation of the library's volunteer and collections enhancement crowdsourcing program uh, called By the People um, and developed a body of work around machine learning in libraries and digital scholarship and managed LC Labs outreach. Uh, she previously cultivated programs of engagement at uh, the Smithsonian uh, Transcription Center as the project coordinator. Um, and her work has centered on advising on workflows and measuring impact while identifying the best ways to steward particip participatory experiences. She received an MA in history from Old Dominion University and holds her PhD in sociology from the University of Glasgow. Um, and then finally, we'll be hearing from uh, Elena Via Espesa. Uh, Elena uh, works as an assistant professor uh, at the Pratt in Institute School of Information. Her research and teaching areas of interest include digital strategy, data analytics, and user experience research, um, and applied evaluation within the museum sector. Uh, Elena is co-founder of the Museums Plus AI Network, which explores the usage of artificial intelligence in museums. Um, she completed a PhD in digital heritage at the School of Museum Studies uh, at the University of uh, Leicester. I don't know if I pronounced that right, in the UK, um, and an MA in Arts Management at the University Universidad Carlos III uh, in Madrid, Spain. Uh, she has previously worked as a digital analyst at the Metropolitan Museum of Art and, and at Tate. 
In these roles, she was in charge of establishing and overseeing an analytics program to monitor and assess museum digital channels, platforms, and programs. Okay, so now that uh, you know all about our, the speakers um, in the panel, um, we'll start off uh, with uh, John Stack. Thanks, Mike. It's Lester, but, <laughs> but English, our English language is constructed of many other languages over thousands of years, so there's no problem to get it wrong. So thanks for the intro. Um, so I'm going to talk about a project that we worked on um, during uh, the pandemic, uh, including working with a software developer who I only ever met in person once. Um, so next slide, please. Okay, so like a lot of uh, uh, other cultural heritage organizations, we're undertaking a large scale digitization project. Um, our collection is about 425,000 objects and about 7 million 2D archival um, uh, pieces. And over the next couple of years, we'll get to about 50% of the three dimensional objects uh, digitized. Um, and we're undertaking it. It's a rapid digitization project. So it's aiming for breadth over depth. So many images, but actually quite thin cataloging to start with. Next slide. Uh, and so in common with uh, a lot of other institutions, we're putting our collection online in a, in a website and the primary discovery mode is therefore inevitably um, search. Next slide. Um, and so the search results are presented, um, you know, in, in a grid format. Next slide. So then you select on an individual object. We have what you would expect, titles, uh, images. Next slide. And a certain amount of metadata and some, uh, some objects with uh, long descriptions, but most objects with really quite short descriptive texts. Next slide. Um, which means that the kind of mode for uh, discovery uh, requires users to uh, know about the collection, understand that it might contain relevant resources, then they've got to uh, find that that content's available online, navigate by keyword, search, uh, grasp the relevance of that content in the, in the search results, and then hopefully they'll find something. And then from there, potentially they can navigate to um, other resources. Next slide. So our, our project was called Heritage Connector. It was um, about 21 months long. And the, and the overarching research question was looking at how digital tools and methods can be used to uh, build relationships at scale between poorly and inconsistently cataloging, cataloged uh, materials and, and other content sources. So the traditional way of um, improving um, search and discovery, we would be to undertake um, manually based cataloging and link building and writing of text, all of which requires uh, subject matter expertise. So they were talking about archivists, um, collection specialists and, and curators and so on. So it's actually very hard to scale up, especially in a project like ours, where um, the velocity of the actual digitization means that working behind uh, the, the cataloging um, metadata is, is quite difficult. So next slide. So we're looking at five content sources for our project. Next slide. So um, our collection in the top left hand corner, uh, the, the collection of the Victorian Albert Museum, uh, which is over the road from our main museum in London. And at one point, the two collections were actually a single uh, collection. So they share a lot of uh, commonality. So sometimes the v &A will have a, a textile and will have the loom on which that textile was made. Uh, in the bottom left hand corner is our online peer reviewed scholarly publication. And in the bottom right um, are the museum's blogs. So we wanted to select two additional content sources, one of which was very scholarly and one of which was more for informal in its writing. And then the, the fifth content um, was Wikidata. Next slide. So, so Effie um, referred to this a little bit earlier, uh, but just to give a bit of background on what Wikidata is. So this is a Wikipedia page and, uh, and Wikipedia pages are constructed from a number of other Wikipedia projects. So the main body of text there is edited in Wikipedia and that can be different in different languages. 
The images come from Wikimedia Commons, which is common across all languages and all Wikipedia projects. Um, but the, the panel on the right hand side, and sometimes you'll see a panel at the bottom of the page too, are, as it were, the facts in Wikipedia. Um, so it's, it's the kind of raw underlying data that um, powers those things. And, and increasingly, the uh, Wikidata has been used for other things like the um, Google, Google Knowledge Panel on the right hand side of the search results page in Siri uh, and so on. Next slide. Uh, so this is an example of a Wikidata page. This is like the human readable version, but you can get a sense of like, here's a company and it has various in, uh, in, information around the company, um, around, you know, where it was formed, uh, dates and so on, uh, locations um, uh, and other data. It's also critically uh, machine readable. So um, you can access Wikidata through a programming API. So next slide. So this give you a sense of uh, the initial thinking when we when we approach this project. So this is a uh, a photograph in our collection. Next slide. So in terms of like looking at uh, the content and how we might be able to sort of build build links between our collection and, uh, and the BNA and other places and Wikidata, you can see that there's various uh, structured fields in our data. Uh, base in our collection database. So the ones at the top and the ones at the bottom. And then in the middle, we've got some free text fields. Uh, next slide. And then if we can uh, link the uh, reference to that train station to the Wikidata uh, entry on the right hand side, you can see that suddenly we've got a lot more information available to us, including the latitude and longitude, the various train companies involved in that, um, a photograph of it as it is today, uh, and so on. Next slide. Uh, so really, this is a link building project. Um, it's using a bunch of technologies, which I'll come on to in, in, in a second. But just sort of in summary, where were we trying to get to with this? So next slide. Fundamentally, our, our collection is really structured like this currently. So blue, blue dots might be um, people or companies uh, or events, and black dots might be objects. So at the moment, we've got quite thin data and relatively small number of links uh, between them. So next slide. So uh, we're trying to take some of those um, things and link them up to Wikidata. And then from Wikidata, we can move through there to other places um, because Wikidata also includes references to uh, other collections and to other um, knowledge bases. So that's the first component. Next slide. Uh, and then within that, we can then start using um, some of these links to build links within our own collection that didn't previously exist. Next slide. Uh, and then we can do some, some kind of clustering. So we can kind of group together things within our collections in ways that didn't um, previously exist by putting out kind of themes and topics that cut across the, the collections and Wikidata uh, to expose new kinds of uh, groupings. So next slide. We're looking at, we used our three technologies. So machine learning, specifically natural language processing, uh, linked data as our uh, kind of data structure, and then uh, knowledge graphs as a way of holding that, um, that data. So the next slide. Uh, so I'm not gonna go into tons of technical details. There's a very detailed uh, technical paper, which you can get to via our blog. There's a link at the end. Um, there's a number of technical blog posts. But in, in one of the key things that we were trying to do, which sort of differentiates the project was on the left-hand side, you'll see this is uh, a relational database kind of model. So which is how collection management systems traditionally handle uh, collections. So the various kind of pieces of information are held in tables and those tables are then interlinked with each other, uh, which is great. But the, one of the tricky things is if you want to add a new piece of knowledge, you have to add a new table, um, which means that it's not very easy to expand them out um, uh, in very kind of free flowing, free form ways. And they're also, those collection management systems are also doing all kinds of other things and generally don't support um, uh, uh, kind of extension in the kind of ways I'm describing. So on the right hand side is uh, linked data, which uses triples. So 
which is so there's kind of a, a subject a relationship and then uh, an object so a person lived in a place or was born in a place and those triples can then be described in linked data as urls so each each component there uh, can be a link so on to the next slide so this uh is is our basic model so we're taking tabular collection data and we're moving it into um a, a linked data um repository in in the center and we're using a number of different techniques uh, to do that and i'll just quickly talk through a kind of high level overview of those so next slide so really what we were talking about is natural language processing so at the top there we have um, an object in our collection and we're going to try and identify that object um, in Wikidata. Um, and we can do the same for the other fields in the database, materials, um, events, companies, and so on. So that's phase one. And then the bottom, the second phase was looking at named entity re recognition and entity linking from within descriptive texts, be those descriptions of objects, but also um, uh, blog posts and journal articles. So essentially in the top one, we know that that is the name of the object. So we can, in our machine learning, we can say, well, try and find something else, which is an object which has that name or an event of that name or, or a person of that, that name and so on. And the bottom one is looking at kind of free form content and trying to essentially do the same thing, but by extracting people and companies and space missions and so on from that free text. So next slide, please. So some high level statistics, we were able to generate hundreds uh, of thousands of links. I think the final data set is more than 10 million links. And that came from about um, 600,000 objects um, and about uh, 8,000 sort of people, people and companies. Um, and we were able to link those up with about 100,000 Wikidata or Wikipedia pages. Um, we identified about 1.2 million things, which the system thought were companies, people, events, and so on, but wasn't able to identify um, an outbound link for those, but we captured them anyway. So next slide. So then we were thinking, so then the final part is, what, what, what does that mean to end users and how might we present that data? So next slide. And we, we were looking at kind of four potential areas uh, of exploration. One is kind of macro views of entire collections so that uh, a user can kind of look at a whole collection and understand what's in it. It's especially important for a collection like ours, which is much more diverse than you might think. It, everything from art to aeroplanes to medical equipment and ethnographic collections and so on. Looking at serendipitous discovery, so like related links and how do you kind of push content um, into people based on what they're looking at. New entry points, so taking things that are not in our catalogue, but we've been able to identify as kind of uh, as links within Wikidata or within our uh, journal articles and so on, as a kind of place from which you can then jump into the collection. Uh, and then new forms of interface, which might provide an alternative to search. Next slide. So we built a handful of demonstrators based on our data set, and I'll talk through a couple of them in a second. And there are some additional um, demonstrators that were developed uh, as part of a hackathon. All of this is on our, our blog, so next slide. So the, the, the data set uh, it exists or can be turned into vector space, which is well, had like more than 100 dimensions in it. Uh, and so it was then flattened down to a two-dimensional um visualization which you can kind of zoom into and click on things so all of this clustering is done by the computer it's not based on our um uh it's not based on our collection cataloging categories uh it's done by the, the nearness of things to each other and so what you'll see is objects in the vna's collection and our collection and wikidata that relate around particular topics uh group closer together and then you, you can you can click on this and uh and color code it in different ways to start exploring it. Next slide. Uh, we developed a bookmarklet, so you can install the bookmarklet in your browser and then as you're browsing our collection, you can pull up uh, in a panel on the right-hand side the related links that the system's pulled out. Uh, one of the things that you get from this is you see that the related content uh, generated here is way better than our, than our previous um, related content on our website. Next slide, please. 
Uh, we then worked on a map interface. So we took all of the latitude and longitudes for things in Wikidata that um, were in our knowledge graph, and then we pinned those on a map. So the map, there's two maps. Google Maps has a limit of, I think it's 10,000 pins, or no, it's 20,000 pins per map. So there's two maps, each with like 10,000 pins on, and you can then click into places and then see all the content in our knowledge graph related to uh, those areas as a kind of new form of experimental interface. So next slide, please. A couple more slides on our findings. So firstly, the methods did generate an enormous number of links. So one of the things that to be aware of is you probably want to be quite selective about the content you start with because you're going to generate a huge amount of stuff. So definitely some fruitful avenues for search and discovery. The free text fields and the article content were really valuable locations for link building. So even relatively short descriptive texts of like one or two sentences ended up, generally speaking, having some uh, being able to generate valuable links. So it might feel to a curator that they're not doing an object justice, but actually in these kinds of techniques, these things are very valuable. Uh, we, could, we were able to show we could put in data alongside the catalog. There were some false positives in there, but they were actually, generally speaking, readily apparent. They were quite obvious. It would be an 18th century thing, and then it'd be linked to a American baseball player with uh, the same name. Um, we were able to generate some new um, interfaces, and they were generally needed because working straight into knowledge graphs, the interfaces are very, very technical and very unforgiving if you get a single comma in the wrong place. Uh, next slide, please. So finally, some things to consider. Um, the need for like framing of machine generated content uh, and contextualizing it when it's presented to end users, uh, in part because it challenges the sort of canonical nature of collection cataloging data, which is generally thought of by the institution and by users as being kind of the truth and the authority. So approach these things critically. Very specialist technical skills are needed in this area, and human expertise is needed throughout, both in kind of reviewing interfaces, but also selecting content and looking at kind of findings and tweaking algorithms and so on. Next slide, please. Thanks very much. So there's links to the project there. There's, there's quite, a, quite a thorough blog with lots of links in it to explore, including the things I showed earlier. Great. Thank you, John. Um, and, and next we'll have uh, Megan. Hi, thanks. Next slide, please. As Mike mentioned, I'm Megan Ferreter and I'm a Senior Innovation Specialist at the Library of Congress with the Digital Innovation Lab, which is locally known as LC Labs. And in 2020, we were really walking slowly towards some events and some experiments we were planning. Uh, activities became impossible and our concerns like so many other people were really lined with other issues. So we turned toward improving upon some of the things we do best, gathering people and convening expertise and experimentation to collect the evidence and demonstrate possibility. And we also took this time to enhance our understanding of machine learning and AI and gallery library and archive uh, and museum contexts. And when reflecting on the last two years, John gave me a great tee up here, reflecting on the last two years and explorations of machine learning, one undeniable element really stands out to us. And that's that people are essential to the tools and approaches that we really are hoping will transform our practices as possibility. Next slide, please. In LC Labs, we are, uh, next slide, please. There we go. In, in LC Labs, we're really a small team and we work collaboratively and strategically. And we constantly embrace that we don't have all the answers. And so on this slide is an undertaken to enhance access to and use of collections through machine learning and public engagement. And in 2019, we had begun a brief period of research and experimentation in machine learning, but it became a more robust line of work as the global pandemic took hold. And throughout this time, we hosted events, sponsored research and experiments, uh, explored user needs from a range of angles and, and pretty frequently shared the outcomes of this work as is our practice in LC Labs. Um, and one thing that no is by embracing those team strengths of convening people and experimentation to pursue really complex and complicated and confusing time, it just put into relief how much people impact what is possible. So here are some examples of how we centered people in the explorations of machine learning crowd processing and data enrichment. Next slide, please. This slide that's coming up features recommendations that have come out of our um, body of ML-focused initiatives. And we've really tried to integrate 
um, these outcomes into the levels of experimentation we've undertaken since 2020. If and when implemented, we really think that these recommendations would benefit not only the Library of Congress, but a wider field, and I think are echoed throughout presentations today and yesterday as well. When looking a little bit more closely at these call-outs, we, we actually see six recurring ways to integrate people into our work with machine learning, and so I'll give some examples of those. Next slide, please. So LC Labs connects our values to practices, meaning that we're really constantly examining the kinds of behaviors that our actions enable and inhibit. And then we try to adjust and cultivate responsible practice in other ways. So for example, uh, on the left-hand side of this slide, you'll see um, a slide from a workshop for our Andrew W. Mellon Foundation supported Computing Cultural Heritage in the Cloud Initiative, or CCHC, which is less of a mouthful. And we've defined and refined our values in each of the three phases of this collaborative work so far. And that includes being inviting and transparent, being flexible, centering ethical practices, and holding space for people who are not in the room. And thinking through these values really helps us pursue those grant goals with a focus on proactively improving upon the ways we connect with people outside of our core team, um, even as obstacles, including a pandemic, uh, are put into our way. On this slide, on the left, you can see those values. And on the right-hand side, you can see um, some values developed by uh, myself and Dr. Mia Ridge and Dr. Sam Blicken in a collective wisdom project, which is a collaboration with the British Library and Zooniverse. And we really focused on articulating values for the events that we were planning to host, which included a, a really intensive book sprint and some intensive workshops as well. And they really helped us adapt those intensive experiences for the real needs of our participants. And then um, particular methods for knowledge exchange and uh, perspective. Next slide, please. Another way that we embrace our values is by inviting other people into our organization, such as with the Innovator in Residence program. And it focuses on developing a project that engages the public in some way. This slide features the projects of our 2020 Innovators in Residence, Brian Fu and Benjamin Charles Germain Lee, with the Newspaper Navigator tool on the left and the Citizen DJ application on the right. While we really could spend a lot of time and dive in more deeply into the socio-technical considerations and user research and resulting features of these amazing projects, I want to touch on how Ben and Brian design public engagement with machine learning processes and their outcomes in these interfaces. So in addition to the openly documented and carefully designed data transformations that were enabled by the machine learning um, featured in this projects, Ben and Brian took care to center the real needs of different communities. Newspaper Navigator, for example, has been used by family search enthusiasts and genealogists, as well as educators. And Ben's reflection on digitization and loss in machine learning processes can help Newspaper Navigator users understand how technical and social decisions really do result in absences that people might encounter in their results. And Brian used machine learning to represent audiovisual collections for amateur sonic more than topical features. He also prepared a guide for this particular user group to support responsibly seeking copyright permissions and understand the ethical considerations using historical samples. Next slide, please. We really think that, uh, which I think everyone here agrees, and we've heard again throughout this conference so far, that ethics are our shared responsibility. And beyond simply saying that we must take care in the selections and approaches and permissions we give, we really need to also share the consequences that we experience and the impacts on communities and uh, what we catalyze with unintend unintended effects and uh, in the challenges of proliferating bias and harm in addition to the actual data outcomes. Next slide, please. And some of the ways that we've tried to uh, approach and embrace that approach includes a workshop and a, an experiment we undertook with AVP called Humans in the Loop, which was an attempt to better articulate the risks and benefits accompanying the work uh, encompassing the work that we wish to do with this particular experiment. So we were thinking on this slide, you can see mapping of um, considering a particular candidate collection and thinking about the subject collections, the participants in the machine learning with subject matter experts who are also actual people too. Um, in the end, through this kind of careful assessment and thinking through ways to mitigate harms, we um, were showing in this slide an example of thinking through Sanborn maps as a collection, but we actually selected yellow pages from the US telephone directories. And I think you could take a few seconds to consider the potential benefits and consequences of applying machine learning to this kind of collection. Without careful planning and design um, and without using prototyping, it would really be easy to abstract data away from the cultural context of these directories and inadvertently harms to communities that are still existing in those areas. 
So this is another place where I would signal that our experimentation in LC labs is really a key dimension of this type of work. Surfacing evidence and evaluating everything from the source material to the impacts on people and data outcomes and the other consequences of human decision making is right in line with centering people. So it's a call here to move intentionally and build appropriate solutions for the problems at hand. For grounding care for people and human interpretation is really essential to the outcomes of machine learning and AI processes and other informatics tools. Um, and more specifically, various and intersecting forms of subject matter expertise are really required to ensure that these systems that are built by humans are not harming other humans through their processes. Next slide. This image is also on various forms of expertise for the work ahead of us. Another body of work we've undertaken during the pandemic has been our Computing Cultural Heritage and Cloud Initiative, where we're exploring infrastructure, collections and data, and the blends of skills that would be necessary to support computational research with the library's collections at scale and in the cloud. And it's a really key example, this initiative, of the many ways of bringing together subject matter expertise that will be required to transform our organizations and the ways that people engage with us. And in the course of supporting three digital humanists and computational researchers in 2021, our uh, core team for CCHC convened over 60 meetings for our staff and we integrated perspectives from staff whose responsibilities um, essential, but also expertise, including reference support, digital collections management, security, community management, user research, workflows. Um, experimentation and web archiving. So just to name a few of the types of expertise essential for this work. Uh, and then we also have taken the opportunity to integrate the reflections and experiences of our eight person advisory board into this planning approach. We'll have some internal working groups with CCHC, including a collections working group with staff and an ancillary working group focusing on the data set that might be shared via the cloud. And they are really great examples of the ways that really explicitly and um, bring people together to focus on complicated topics can generate tangible artifacts that can help these practices as well, such as um, generating 10 questions for computational researchers and documenting the current state of data request models. Next slide, please. I'm hoping that my description so far of our LC Labs practices um, shared goals. We really enjoy gathering with people and sharing what we're learning and hearing what other people are undertaking, such as a, an event like this. Um, and in 2020, as we thought about the impact of the global pandemic, it really became clear that we needed to add a layer of coordination to our convenings to really account for being gathered. We dove into some methods to help us scaffold these gatherings and hosted a blend of open calls and invited and registered events. And um, at each of these events, we wanted to not only help surface uh, possibilities for um, unexpected opportunities to partner and surface key emergent practices and brought in networks of practitioners, but also to really focus on empowering and including all of the voices of the people who are participating in these events. So in events like the 2020 Informal Virtual AV Summit and Collective Wisdom Project events and uh, Humans in the Loop workshop at the Future Fantastique workshops, we saw that thinking about people holistically and finding ways to make space for their humanity and sometimes even forgotten and latent expertise meant that we could surface the ingenuity that people display when they're helping solve problems for one another. And of course, as we continue to explore this work, we hope to contribute um, what we will learn in other communities of practice as well. And uh, so next slide, please. So a final call for some constant attention and improvement as we collectively continue to explore and apply these methods and informatics tools. To improve our shared landscape and apply practice, we really must proactively commit to bringing in diverse representation and experiences to our work and ask hard by subject matter expertise and community knowledge and lived experience will be essential to that process of improving teams. Next slide, please. And in the end, our investigation of machine learning in our context highlights the needs to constantly consider people. And what's clear to us is that uh, people across the world are undertaking incredible projects and surfacing rich findings in the complexities of cultural heritage data, workflows, and human expertise. Although impl implementation is not yet comprehensive at organizations and that interdisciplinary subject matter expertise is needed to transform the field, 
and knowledge exchange is essential. We must continue to proactively discuss the harms and risk and hold one another accountable to the communities and histories we steward. And looking ahead, we echo other calls to broaden, strengthen networks, and commit to share what we learn and hope to achieve, and really be explicit about the decision-making moments through which people can improve the adoption of technology and related practices. Next slide, please. Thank you. Our next, our body of work really enforces to us that the future of uh, machine learning and AI and GLAMS will rely on people and especially collaboration, knowledge exchange, and integrating interdisciplinary expertise. And you can find more on our uh, LC Labs letter, the Signal blog, and our Twitter at LC Labs. Thank you. All right. Thank you so much, Megan. Um, and uh, next we have uh, Elena. Hello everyone. So um, in this presentation, I'm going to be talking about the museums and AI network. Uh, this is a um, um, network of museums and academic experts where um, we work together to discuss the opportunities um, and, uh, and also challenges that uh, museums face when using AI. Um, I will be um, showing you different examples and also some conclusions of the project. And um, before I go into the slides, also to mention that I've done this research in collaboration with Donna, uh, Dr. Una Murphy from, uh, the, uh, from Goldsmiths University of London. Next slide, please. Um, so yeah, this was a partnership between Goldsmiths and Pratt Institute. Um, we collaborated with different museums, both in um, the US and the UK, that included the Met, the National Gallery, um, the American Museum of Natural History, Welcome Collection, Science Museum Group, and others. Next slide, please. So we uh, analyzed, like, okay, what are the opportunities and challenges using AI for visitor data, but also collection data. For the purpose of this presentation and related to the topic of this conference, I'm going to focus on the collection data. So here are some of our research questions that we had. So what are the opportunities and challenges of applying different AI technologies to collection data? Um, how can museums minimize algorithm biases to interpret their, uh, their collections? Uh, we know there's a lack of diversity in museums, collections, and also in the AI field. So how is going to that impact the outcomes of using these technologies? Um, and also some of the things we discuss is, you know, what are the implications of museums engaging with big tech companies as most of museums were using um, their algorithms to interpret their collections? Next slide, please. So as I mentioned, this uh, network brought uh, different experts, universities, museum professionals, but also we engage uh, with members of the public in different public events. Uh, next slide. So here you can see some uh, pictures of the events we did. It was uh, before pandemic. And uh, you can see these are the um, uh, photos from our first event uh, at Goldsmiths, where we discussed the intended and unintended consequences of AI and um, different missions presented um, their projects. And in the next slide, um, you're going to see some photos of our workshop activities um, at Pratt. Next slide. Thank you. And in the next slide, uh, you are going to see um, some uh, photos of our public events. Um, we did one at the Barbican Center and one at Cooper Hewitt Smithsonian Design Museum. Um, we have documented all these activities and um, there's some videos as well and I'll share some links at, at the end where you can see um, this information. Next slide. So we have continued this research. So af after these events, uh, we have continued like mapping um, different case studies and continue doing some research and experiments of using um, different technologies. So one of the first things we did um, at the beginning of the project was to see how, you know, mapping, like what, how museums are using AI, what are the different examples? And here you can see, you know, a timeline which, you know, different dots that represent the number of um, examples that we found in papers, um, press releases, blogs, and, and so on. And so you can see it's increasing. We are updating it now for 2021-2022, and um, it's classified here. Um, as you can see, the majority of projects fall under computer vision, um, machine learning, natural language processing. So those are the main uh, technologies I'm going to be talking about during my presentation. Uh, you can access, um, uh, if you go to the next slide, 
Um, you can access the full list. We have collected um, over 120 examples of museums using AI, so you can access it through that link. And you will see um, um, a short description, categorization of the type of project, and links as well um, to, to the source. Uh, next slide. So I'm uh, pulling that from that list and I work with these museums. I'm gonna briefly talk about some of the case studies that were presented and then go into some of the findings of the project. Um, so we had um, the Welcome Collection presented how they were using um, computer vision, natural language processing, um, to do different things, uh, to improve their search, uh, to do some tagging, um, and also to use, you know, um, some color coding of their collections and find similarities between objects in their collection. Uh, we also have missing professionals from the uh, from Princeton University Art Museum, where uh, they talk about how they were using natural language processing to identify uh, entities in the scholarly text. Next slide. And another example we have documented is uh, Prado Museum. They have also used natural language processing uh, to uh, go into the um, um, artworks descriptions and identify different entities uh, like places, uh, dates, um, people, and then link that, um, as John was also talking, like to other data sources like Wikidata and Wikipedia. And they have created a timeline where you can navigate through time, find the different artworks, and you will see different layers like uh, history, literature, um, and other things that um, show the context of those artworks. Uh, next slide. Uh, we also have uh, missing professionals from Harvard Art Museums, and they've done this interesting experiment where they apply different computer vision technologies uh, to their collections. And it was interesting to see uh, the different results these um, the different computer vision tools provided. Um, next slide. Um, another participant was the MED and um, they presented about some of the tagging projects that um, they've worked on, how they've used as well different technologies. And what was interesting is to see how they are engaging with the computer science community um, in projects like you know, pages like Kaggle competition um, to, to engage with different type of audiences that may be interested in, in using their skills um, and apply them to, uh, to art. Uh, next slide. So here are some of the findings um, across all the case studies that were presented and the discussions that happened during the network and further research that we've done. So one of the key things is that um, computer vision, natural language processing, and all these different AI tools allow museums to present a collection in new ways. Um, it offers new ways to analyze, describe, um, and present what uh, museums have. Um, so here are some quotes from um, a couple of participants. Um, so um, I think the first one is actually from John Stack, um, where um, he was describing how um, having like very um, I think metadata and using computer vision will allow to um, tag the collection and help the, the discovery of um, their collection. Um, in the second one, um, one of the participants um, was using about um, how museums, you know, we have our own terminology, ways of describing our taxonomies, and these tools will allow to find different ways of describing the collection. Uh, next slide. Uh, so here's an example uh, from, from the MED. Uh, so you can see here in the slide, the tagging that museum has for these objects, which include, you know, women, portrait, um, but also the tags generated by um, the algorithms. Um, so it's actually more descriptive. You can see things like dress, hat, colors. Um, so different, completely different vocabulary that the museum was using. Uh, next slide. And back to that example from Harvard Art Museums, um, you can see that you know these different tools uh, provide different terminology for the same artwork, um, and it can go like very descriptive to for this object, specifying which fruits are there, but also even to add um, some adjectives and maybe um, other subjective terms to it, like you know healthy, uh, delicious, um, and so on. And next slide. 
Um, so here's um, um, another example from a case study that we did with the MED, um, where we applied uh, three different um, computer vision technologies, so similar to Harvard Art Museums. We applied to the highlights of the collection, about a thousand objects. And that Venn diagram, what it shows is that uh, the number of unique tags that were generated by the algorithms. And you can see the intersection is um, actually very small. So it was a very limited number of keywords that were generated by the three uh, computer uh, vision tools. So it's interesting to think about, okay, what is a collection, what is missing? And how we have to, what is the criteria we need to have to select the tool that will help us to describe eye collection? Some of them were better at describing colors, some of them provided more and a higher number of synonyms, um, others were more specific about um, you know, identifying people and characteristics. Um, next slide, please. Um, another finding from this project um, is that majority of applications that uh, we saw that were presented are still very experimental for different reasons, um, but they are not launched in most of cases to the digital, you know, official websites or digital interfaces um, of the museum. Uh, some of them is because of uh, the internal debate um, and the risk of, you know, providing information that is not completely accurate and has been uh, generated by an algorithm. Um, other reasons include that there is lack of internal expertise um, uh, to, to work on that on an ongoing basis. So not many, very few museums have a data scientist or uh, people that can not have the time to focus on this um, um, in a big scale. Uh, next slide. And so here I have a couple of those um, first prototypes that were presented. So the first one is from the Met Explorer, um, where you can uh, search by the tags generated by the Microsoft Computer Vision System. Um, and on the right, you have the uh, IIIF um, Explorer from Harvard Art Museums, where they have different options to interact with the collection um, based on um, the algorithm. So uh, for example, you have the a magic message where you type different um, keywords and you will get crops from artworks uh, that actually include that keyword, that word that you enter. Um, so it's quite interesting. So you can create sentences from um, crops from different artworks. Uh, next slide. So one of the, um, the um, primary focus of this research project was to think about the ethical implications of using AI um, so we did a lot of exercises and activities around the whole AI processes and thinking about what the mission has to consider at each step. So um, from the data input stage, uh, thinking about, okay, um, how is the collection already biased? Um, how, um, what is missing? Um, what are the, um, what are the, um, like, lack of diversity and sometimes in, in the gaps in, in those collections. And then when we defined and trained the data and defined the model, like what is that black box? What are the uh, consequences of working with these big tech companies um, to, uh, to provide the output? Um, how transparent is that process? Um, and how we select those technologies. Um, and finally, uh, when we think about the data output, you know, how we then um, provide it to the user, how we generate those like, digital experiences, and also how we evaluate the success of that AI initiative. Uh, next slide. Um, so here is uh, related to that some um, of the uh, reasoning of you know, the ethical um, and challenges with using um, AI. So um, there are a lot of, you know, errors that are generated, like there's a need for more data to train algorithms. I like this quote from Jenny Choi, Collection Information Manager at the Med, who said like, we only have 600 cats and you typically need like thousands uh, to train, um, you know, the, the machine learning algorithm. And as you can see in the screen, um, the cats from the Mets collection are very varied. And so um, that makes the point of, you know, how even with a large collection, you still need more data to train the algorithm. Uh, next slide. Um, another, um, 
challenges the lack of context and interpretation. So, uh, for example, in this case, um, the algorithms were able to identify that this was a sculpture, a statue, but they were not able to identify that this was Cleopatra. And same happens with other historical figures. Next slide. Um, and then accuracy is one of the main challenges. Um, you have here some obvious examples where the algorithm failed completely. Um, and yeah, this is one of the reasons and um, challenges of museums not providing those um, information in the uh, interfaces. Next slide. So uh, to conclude, I wanted to share um, some of the resources we have created um, based on that project, as this may be helpful for some museums that are thinking about an AI project. Uh, next slide. So we have developed a toolkit with different worksheets that we actually use during the project. Uh, thanks to the um, museum professionals, we improved those worksheets during the project, and now they are um, available on our project website. Uh, next slide. We also have here links of some of the publications we've done. Some of them are open source, uh, so you can check them out. Uh, I think you have one more slide. Yeah, so just to conclude that, uh, yeah, you can access those resources on our um, uh, research project page. And we've seen a huge interest in the last couple of years in this project. We know there are other um, museum networks being uh, organized in different places in the world. Um, so I think like collaboration across museums to share those challenges and opportunities is definitely something key in um, moving forward and applying AI to museum collections. Thank you. All right, thank you so much, Elena and, and Megan and, and John as well. Um, so uh, again, uh, it'd be great if uh, everyone in the chat could give uh, a round of applause and, and you all can imagine that you're getting one right now because those were great presentations. Um, so I have some questions lined up here um, from, from the audience. Um, and first one I want to start out with um, uh, applies to all of you. So hopefully uh, you can take turns answering this. Um, and that is, how do we support and acknowledge the underlying work needed to support all of these projects, such as acquisition, preservation, description, digitization systems, et cetera? Who wants to start off? can try. One thing that I think um, kind of stands out in some of the experiments that we've undertaken. So again, we, we are really at an exploratory step for this. But one thing that we try to do is bring many different many um, different types of expertise and people who are involved in different parts of the process and acknowledge consistently that the work of bringing uh, objects to the point of being data is essential to any of this kind of ongoing work. So we've tried that in a couple of our different experiments and actually what we find particularly in supporting our innovators and residents and in our CCHD initiative is that um, those decision making, organizational decision making and professional and disciplinary decision making is what helps inform and improve the results of the outcomes. So those setting up those one-on-one -on -one discussions or kind of scaffolding knowledge exchange through a workshop um, really kind of helps us carry it forward. I think there are other opportunities to um, acknowledge significantly with a statement or you know, to kind of carry forward that work. Um, and I'd love to see other examples as well. Yeah, I totally agree. I think it, it's something that, I think, it's, I think as part of all these projects, we have to recognize the, the human work that goes on to create the material in which we're working. Um, because what these techniques are not going to do anytime soon, and maybe they will in the future with their Mr. Sarbis and his general AIs, which maybe will come, maybe not in our lifetimes, they're not going to replace curators or photographers or catalogers. It's really augmenting them. A lot of the projects at the moment are very focused also out to in public interfaces, but I think there's probably uh, interesting work also to be around consideration of how these tools can help people involved in the digitization project. So that feels like a sort of fruitful thing to think about in, in, in the coming years. Um, but yeah, fu fundamentally, 
all of this all of this work requires the kind of up, the upstream content generation especially when you start to think about about training data for for cultural heritage organizations so one of the things that we saw in the interface that we built with uh, computer vision for a lenders project was how often the computer vision thought that things in our collection in our medical instruments collection were weapons and so but and so these these systems are not generally these the off-the-shelf systems are not trained on cultural heritage content and so of course they get these things wrong but but as elena says they'd actually need enormous corpuses of like roman artifacts or whatever in order to be able to work well on those and so actually what that points towards is if we really want to use these tools effectively in the future we're going to need more digitized content than ever before uh and we're going to need it to be open access in the way that Effie was talking about right at the start of this this session. I will add that yeah, one of the discussions we've had during the project is about the resources and to undertake these AI initiatives, and most of them were project based and initiated by um, people who had that interest in you know primarily from digital departments. Um, so it's not embedded in the whole like, strategy of the museum or in the whole planning. Um, so in order to engage as well other departments to you know, provide those digitized resources to help with um, the QA um, of the results and so on, you, you need basically to, to work across departments. It's not, it, ca it cannot be done in isolation and um, it's a huge number of resources that are needed. And, as John was saying, I they augment the work that museums are doing, but still needs that um, human input in all the stages of, of the process. All right, that was a great segue, actually, Elena, to this next question, um, which I think was uh, asked specifically to, to Megan, but I, I think it applies to, to everyone as well. Um, so the question is, opportunities like the Innovator, Innovator in Residence program are great, but temporary. Um, what can uh, libraries, archives, and museums do to create space for existing staff to innovate and dream? Mike, can I shout out your work with the AI, AI for LAM community? Sure, uh, of course. And developing training for staff. Um, that's a place that you can explore resources. Um, in our CCHC initiative, one of the uh, dimensions that we are exploring is what are the augmenting skills for supporting computational researchers? So we have, that would be a way to really nicely connect into existing skills and expertise at the organization, but to allow for um, some additional pathways for understanding the needs of a varying range of users, whether those are computational researchers or members of the public. So some of those training opportunities, I think are, um, really essential for the, the organizations of the futures that we'd like to be, and also um, tapping into some of these communities of practice that Elena has organized and that other organizations are um, doing part of, it's, for example, the AI for LAM and GLAM Labs communities where people are bringing together resources. That's just the first step because we need organizational focus on um, integrating some of these skills and opportunities. And then uh, Elena and John, do you have anything to add to that? Which is a sort of related point, which, which, which all three of us have touched on in different ways, which is that what these projects really need is multidisciplinary teams. And that's, and that they, we, these questions about what decisions are being made when and by whom and what what different within the institutions within what different sort of practices consider important and how they want to approach these things is like really critically important and 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 then that also ties into sort of the end user needs be that people in the institution or, or that be that the, the public you know researchers teachers whoever and there's more work to be done on what's most valuable to the end user. And there's more work to be done on where best to deploy what's actually was in the muse museums, quite limited human resources, how best to deploy them. And I, I think this is going to need to be an ongoing conversation 
which means that as we do more of these experimental projects, which Elena pointed to, I think they're probably going to, it's probably for the time being going to carry on being a series of projects, but we need to broaden out into the institution to get people involved in the dialogue and create, create the space for that. I mean, really exciting. Yeah, and also once implemented those in digital interfaces, uh, something that we didn't talk much in the network, but it was um, mentioned a few times about the sustainability of those projects. And as AI technologies are changing so quickly, how you will update those um, digital interfaces and products. Because, I mean, as an example, um, I have the data set of computer vision tags generated for the MEDS collection three years ago and then a year ago. And they are so different. I mean, it's much better accuracy. So if you had that done a project like implemented on the online collection three years ago, what you do, you know, next year, uh, how you keep that being updated um, and taking advantage of um, those tools. Yeah, there's also a, something, there's, a great point. Oh, go ahead, John. There's also something here about, about scale, which is that you can you can take your collection and individually one by one, just pass them through, you know, manually through some of these services. Sort of pretty much anyone in the school could do that. But in order to really evaluate it, you have to do it at scale. And so, and that's why it becomes suddenly a much, a much bigger project. Um, because the the findings versus just doing one by one at a time, we did like 25 or whatever, just at the beginning to see how it would go, versus doing them all and then suddenly analyzing all the data that comes back. That's a great point. All right, and we have time for one last question. I think this is hopefully sets us off on a on a good uh, footing here. So uh, going off of a previous question about uh, making space for researchers in the institution, how can we make room for students or people looking to begin a career? So now's your chance to be inspirational and uh, give some inspiring words here. Sorry, um, I'll, I'll, I'll just can, point, how about Elena? Go ahead. <laughs> I was gonna say that, I mean, being in a, in a, in a university with uh, people from different backgrounds and also doing some research about uh, this topic, what is interesting is um, for those, um, and I, NFE mentioned this in, in her uh, presentation this morning, like for those who are not familiar with museums, um, like suddenly like uh, discover those collections, those data sets is um, very positive and has been a very good experience from the feedback that um, I heard like doing uh, research of APIC museums and how people access um, their collections. Uh, so I think there's a good opportunity for museums to engage with um, people with good programming skills uh, that may be interested in using those and apply those to um, very rich like data sets that museums have. And I'd also like to advocate for programs of junior career exchange, well, even more senior career exchange as well. But um, when we think about the type of work that's essential for all of this, we've already discussed integrating interdisciplinary expertise, but we also need to communicate effectively. So there's communications dimensions. We need to have strategic planning. We need to have um, experimentation. I'm going to advocate for that as well. So there are opportunities to bring into the mix uh, in temporary and long-term approaches and um, find ways to connect to um, the interest of uh, universities and even high schools and community groups who are looking to develop professional expertise and to do that responsibly and to you know to pay our interns or to create equitable of, of um, knowledge exchange at an early part in a career can be trans transformational not only for the person who's participating but also for our organizations. Okay, John, and uh, one uh, last answer to that question, and then we'll head into break. Um, yeah, I agree with what Ethan has just been said by Beth, Elena, and Megan. And I think also it's about like opening up these data sets so that anyone can play with them and experiment with them. Because within any given project, you only have a certain amount of time, and there's always more ideas of where we could have gone next. So by opening up data sets, opening up collections, um, 
releasing the machine generated tags, letting other people explore them um, uh, and approach them critically for analysis or creative projects. Feels like also a good way to go, you know, but and then with a caveat of your mileage may vary. Definitely. All right. Well, thank you so much to the panel. Um, and uh, we're coming up on a break. So um, we'll see you after that.